Right now, New York City officials are providing an update on the response to the influx of asylum seekers. Let's listen in. Asylum seekers. Given that the city is unable to provide care for an unlimited number of people and is already overextended, it is in the best interest of everyone, including those seeking to come to the United States, to be upfront that New York City cannot single-handedly provide care to everyone crossing our border. The city now estimates to have the, the city now estimates to have more asylum seekers in care than New Yorkers experiencing homelessness when the administration first came into office. Let me say that again, that we now have more asylum seekers in our care than we did the homeless folks that were in our um, care when we came in at the administration, which is about 45,000 people. So before we take your questions, joining me today is City Hall's Chief Counsel, Brenda McGuire, Jock Jiha, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, and Manny Castro, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Before I turn it over to Jock, though, let me share the latest numbers with you. We currently have more than 44,700 people currently asylum seekers in our care, and over 70,000 people who have come through our intake center since the beginning of the crisis last spring. We have opened up more than 150 emergency shelters, including nine humanitarian relief centers. As you can see by the numbers, we continue to see a significant increase in the number of people coming to New York City on a daily basis. This has pushed us to open up additional emergency respite sites and move into more counties upstate as part of our voluntary program. I want to now turn it over to J Director Jiha to walk us through the financial pieces in more detail. Ja? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Julia Meissen. Uh, as you said, this is a very costly uh, uh, endeavor for the city to uh, uh, do um, by itself. Uh, as of April 30th, we spent a billion dollars on asylum seekers' uh, uh, needs. Uh, and as you can see um, on the chart, uh, we are providing a range of services uh, to those asylum seekers, ranging from shelter, medical care, food, and social services. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, as you could see also, we have eight agencies coordinating all these activities, including DSS, HNH, NISAM, DCAS, uh, HPD, DOHMH, and DDC. So it's a major, major, major effort on the part of uh, the city that consumes a lot of time and energy. Next chart. Now I'm going to show you the calculations because right now, as, as we said, we spent a billion dollars. Uh, we believe before July, uh, 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 before the July 1st, we will spend uh, 1.4 billion dollars, and by July uh, of next year. We spent another $2.9 billion for a total of $4.3 billion. <clears throat> Let me quickly walk you through the calculation. That is the basis for the uh, forecast. The math is uh, straightforward. Uh, for fiscal year 23, the average uh, daily census is about 9,751 households. The estimated per diem is uh, $380 a day. And so the total cost is straightforward, as I said, is multiplying the number of households by the number of days in a year, which is 365 days, and multiply by the per diem of 380, that gives you $1.4 billion. In other words, once you uh, 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 forecast the uh, number of households, it is straightforward. The same thing is happening with for 20, uh, 2024. We expecting uh, 24,882 households. Uh, we have an estimated per diem of 320 day, uh, dollar per day. So that is a drop uh, from the 380 that we use to compute uh, the uh, fiscal year 23. And again, you multiply the number of households by the number of days in a year and by the per diem, and you come up with $2.9 billion. Next slide. This slide gives you a sense of the challenges that we're dealing with. That forecast I just mentioned to you was based on the assumptions that uh, we were getting about 40 households a day, okay? For the month of May, we're looking at 188 households a 
a day. Okay, let me repeat again. That forecast was based on the assumption that we'll be getting 40 households a day. We are now at 188. So as you could see on the chart, there is a huge divergence between the actual, which is the, the black line, and the forecast, which is the red line. We don't know if that is going to persist, that's going to uh, sustain over time. We don't know if it's a blip, if it's going to go back through the trend line of, of uh, that we're forecasting. But if that persists, it's going to be a very, very, very expensive proposition to basically cover the cost of caring for the migrants. So we're going to have to update our forecast. Uh, as you already know, the uh, city controller came out yesterday with the forecast, and they already think that our forecast is on a low, low end, and they're already looking at $765 million above our forecast. Okay, We haven't made the decision to change our forecast yet, Okay, but because we're waiting to see if there is a, a new trend that, that would be established. But once we do, we will have to object, uh, update our forecast going forward. So again, we are in the midst of a, of a fiscal crisis. We have received very inadequate aid from both the state and the federal government, in particular the federal government. We have received so far 38, not received, we have been awarded $38.5 million uh, from uh, the federal government. FEMA gave us an award of $8 million last December. And of the $800 million that was allocated to localities nationwide, we have received an initial award of $30.5 million. So the $38.5 million barely covers five days of asylum seeker costs at our current uh, spending uh, rate. Regarding the state, the state uh, is uh, providing us a billion dollars, which is about 29% of the cost over a two-year period of to a billion dollars. This aid would probably cover uh, a bill, uh, five months of asylum seekers over a two-year period, not, a, not over a year, over a two-year period. But however, uh, while the governor gave us a billion dollars, we also have uh, cuts on our budget of about half a billion dollars a year. So whatever we gain on one, on one hand was taken from us on the, other, on the other hand. So this is where we are. And because of uh, the uh, inadequate aid that uh, we have received so far, we're looking at a billion dollar gap that was just open in the executive budget that would have to address our adoption. Again, uh, I'm, so this is you know, where we are. We, take, we, be, we believe we need more assistance from uh, the uh, federal government. And don't forget, we are, we are assuming all these costs in an environment when we're looking at uh, uh, many forecasters predicting like a, a slowdown of the economy or if not a recession at the end of this year. So you can imagine a combination of a big slowdown in the economy where you have a decline in your tax revenue base, at the same time, you're looking at uh, uh, the kind of increases uh, we, uh, 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 we are looking at to spend for uh, the kind of uh, uh, resources that we are looking to spend if that trend were to continue in the future. Anne? Okay, thank you so much, Director Jiha. Um, we'll take questions in a moment, but before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to Immigration's Affairs Commissioner Castro to share some of the updates about ongoing efforts to provide immediate support for the influx of asylum seekers. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor. Um, first, I want to take this opportunity to thank the hundreds of city employees who are working incredibly hard, have been working incredibly hard in support of asylum seekers in New York City. Uh, the logistics of caring for so many people is monumental. And I have seen it firsthand at our humanitarian centers or in our shelter system at our schools, New Yorkers have stepped up and have contributed to this humanitarian crisis like no other city in the country. 
And I also want to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Ann williams Isom and Mayor Adams for leading us through this crisis with incredible humanity, with incredible compassion. We have said this over and over again. It is not the asylum seekers that we are seeing a continued crisis, but it is the inaction by our federal government. Um, so today, as we seek additional support, we want to make clear that this is not about whether if we want to help people. We have and continue to help people. We have helped more people than anywhere else in the country. But as has been said before, we are at a breaking point. And without a real comprehensive strategy by the federal government, an adequate support to our city, this is just not sustainable. We don't want people to show up at our doorstep and end up in the street, whether it's long time immigrants of which we have millions or newly arrived asylum seekers. This is the last thing we want to see happen. This is why we need a sensible conversation about what is possible and what is not moving forward. So at this point, uh, we do not have the physical infrastructure to continue to provide the same level of support to, as, to an, an indefinite number of people. I wish we could, but there are realities we must face. And that is why we are here seeking, again, support from the federal government and seeking for others to do more in response to the humanitarian crisis. I also want to voice concerns coming from our longtime immigrant communities, of which I speak with often. Historically, immigrants have arrived to our city and found shelter with their friends, family members, acquaintances from their countries of origin. Seeking shelter in our city system has been always a last resort. But what we are seeing now is significantly different, as you know, what the buses uh, being sent here by Governor Abbott, flights from other localities, and a lack of decompression strategy by the federal government. Longtime immigrant communities, New Yorkers, fear this is creating a hostility against all immigrants as a whole. And a perception is developing that immigrants seek to depend on the, on the government, which is simply not true. They want to continue to be here to work and contribute back to the city and the country that has provided an opportunity to them all. So this is why we are hearing now from immigrant communities themselves that the current situation cannot continue indefinitely and we need a comprehensive solution by the federal government, including comprehensive immigration reform. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Castro. So in addition to supporting asylum seekers, we do have an unwavering responsibility to continue to provide funding for our schools, for public services, for working families, for our older adults, and essential services for the 8.8 .8 million people who rely on daily us, but we need additional resources. As the mayor has said, this is a national problem and it requires a national solution. No one city can or should be asked to play a disproportionate role, but that's what's happening absent additional support from federal leadership. We don't see an end in sight. And as we have said, we are at a breaking point. It's not fair that all those in our care, approximately 94,000, if you include the folks that are in our DHS system, in all of our emergency centers, that's 94,000 people that are in our care right now, will have to suffer because we have not yet seen a national decompression strategy. With that, we'll now open it up to the floor for questions. I wanted to ask about um, this this piece of the letter that talks about um, the lack of resources, the city not having sufficient resources to, um, to, to abide by the right to shelter law. Um, Mayor Adam was asked about this before, and um, 
kind of put it off to the court. And I'm guessing there was some internal discussion about this. How does the city expect to quantify what that lack of resources is? I mean, in this situation, you're saying that we just kind of reached our limit, but down the road, if, if such a suspension was put in place, like how would the city kind of measure that, I guess? So I'm not gonna get into legal strategy given the filing of the letter. I will, I will though provide you with the thinking in terms of where we are now. Um, and I think what we're faced with now after there being no change um, uh, from the federal, at the federal level after May 11th and the change at, that, at the border with respect to Title 42, uh, we're now 12 months into this. The mayor declared a humanitarian crisis in October. Uh, we have been beating the drum, uh, as you all know, uh, for quite some time now. And we have now gotten to a point <clears throat> where it is, it is essential and necessary to revisit the Callahan requirements because the question is, how is the future going to be any different than the past year? And if the, if the future, there is no reason to believe that uh, anyone is riding in with a solution with respect to the numbers. And so the idea here is, as the mayor has said repeatedly, all options have to be on the table. And the goal here, to be very clear, to be very clear, the idea here is to obtain clarity and additional flexibility to the extent it is needed. That's, that's the goal. And so you're asking specifics. Mike, I appreciate where the question comes from, but we, there's a legal case that is going to follow from, from the filing yesterday where that will be addressed. Do you view that clarity as applying just specifically to the migrant thing or just in perpetuity? I don't understand the question. So the migrant thing? What yeah, do you, I mean, you, you're, you're seeking clarity on Callahan from the court. And I, I, the question is, is, is the, the administration seeking clarity just as it pertains to the migrant crisis or in perpetuity as the law would apply in future situations? So the, 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 the filing relates to Callahan as a whole, it, and it, and it, but it focuses specifically on adults and adult families only. It does not uh, uh, seek any modification with respect to families with children. Um, so it is, it, it is all intertwined in terms of the Callahan requirements. Obviously, 40 plus years ago, uh, the judgment did not distinguish between um, unhoused New Yorkers and asylum seekers. That was obviously a foreign concept back then, and that is one of the real concerns here, is that this never contemplated, Callahan and its progeny never contemplated this reality that we're in. So as a result, this is all part of the same um, issue, it, to, to, to respond to your question, but that's why we're going to court, is, 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 is in an effort now to seek relief based on this reality that was never foreseen. Um, I want to go off that same line of questioning and that particular paragraph because I'm perplexed or I question the logic of saying not you don't want to change the right to shelter when literally that paragraph legally would give you an out to the right to shelter. And if you were actually, if a judge, which you know has not changed this in 40 plus years, does decide to side with you and give you that paragraph, well then what does it look like? Does that mean that migrants are sleeping on the street? Will you no longer be opening up emergency shelters? What's the end game here? What do you exactly want? So what you want, as I go back to it, is clarity and flexibility. And so it's important to be precise about what we're talking about here. Um, when, 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 when things are said like the administration wants to end the right to shelter, um, that is inaccurate. That's why we're pushing back against it. Um, I think you, there are many hypotheticals one could try to spin out from uh, this legal filing, um, I'm not going to get into all of those. What I will say is if you look over the past 12 months, no administration in the history of this city has done more to preserve and ensure the, the Callahan requirements than this one. It's not even close because no administration has been faced with this number um, of people who need help. So the idea that a filing designed to obtain clarity and flexibility in a crisis is a, should be read as a signal that, that the people in this administration, including these folks who've committed themselves to this for the last 12 months, we've suddenly decided, you know what, 
we're now abandoning all of this is I think is is I think completely unfair and distorts what we've done for the last 12 months. The goal here is to uh, again given that 40 plus years ago this current reality was not contemplated to understand what how how a court will address this situation as we deal with obviously the other parties to Callahan in an attempt again to get clarity and flexibility in this in in, in this circumstance. Uh, for Jacques, yesterday you said that you're going to set up a tracker for migrant costs. Um, when is that going to come out? And then also, are you guys going to set up a tracker for how many people are coming in, you know, the daily numbers, and what's going on with the Office of Asylum Seeker operations? When are we going to see that come to fruition and you know, the person named? Yeah, we are currently uh, working on a tracker, like we did for the COVID uh, uh, expenses to give uh, transparency and clarity to folks to see exactly where we're spending and what kind, you know. So the goal is to get it up soon. I can't give you an exact date because I know the uh, uh, programmers are working on it, uh, but uh, uh, we will announce it when it's uh, completed. Uh, regarding the office, I believe uh, we yeah. have somebody. I mean, you want to. So the work of the Office of the Asylum Seeker is continuing. We said that we really wanted to focus on a legal strategy. We wanted to focus more on exits and resettlement. And so the group of folks at City Hall and in the agencies are focused on that. We did name um, Molly Shaker as our interim asylum seeker, the head of the office. And I think we really want to make sure that we're picking the right person for that position and have the right operational experience. And so we'll keep you posted when that position is filled, but the work of what we think the office is doing is going on every day. Right, so that's kind of happening unofficially, but with the team of all these agencies. Correct, yes. So how will things change once it's set up? What will that look like? So I think that... That's, I think that's my point, Bernadette. Like the, the, the infrastructure of who's working on legal strategies, who's working on exits, who's working on front door strategies, who's working very closely with the state on resettlement, all of that work is happening. And we didn't really want to add so many additional new lines. So we've pulled lines from other people in the administration in the similar way that we did during COVID, right? And so we want to financial um, considerations are very important to us. So the work is getting done by a group of people who are going to continue to get that work done. When we announce who's going to be the permanent person, I'm not sure about that, but I will tell you because we want to make sure that we're appointing the right person to do that. A uh, question for Jacques. Uh, you said yesterday the migrant cost could go well past $4.3 billion by next July. Do you have any idea or sense of what that number could be at this point? Well, at this point, I don't know because we, you know, we're looking at the data to see if there's going to be a new trend established over the next two months. Before, because that that could be simply a blip, and you know goes away and come right back to the trend, in which case uh, we don't have to make major adjustment to the forecast. But uh, if that uh, trend persists, we're gonna have to update our forecast sometimes in you know in upcoming plan. Any project cuts in the future? Uh, I don't know at this point in time. I cannot you know so many uncertainties. I cannot say one way or another what we're going to do to address it. If I could just get a quick logistical question, how many respite centers are currently open? There are nine humanitarian centers, and in terms of the emergency respite centers, we keep on opening them as we need them. So I can get you the exact number, but it changes from day to day. If I could just ask, what distinctions are currently being drawn between the traditional homeless New Yorker and the new migrant people who are coming in? You mean in terms of the... So we actually have been trying to keep sanctuary sites for folks because there was some conflict at the beginning. So I think people, when they come here, they're scared, they're nervous, they don't know many people. Staying with their similar community, if we can do that, we've been trying to do. Um, just a question. So uh, when you guys say you're looking to for clarity in this law, um, nowhere in there does it say that you guys are looking for clarity. You guys say that you're actually looking to move it, uh, transition it. Um, so just looking for clarity there, and then also, um, uh, do you guys expect if this were to be modified or returned, what sort of guardrails would be in place to keep people from sleeping on the streets? Well, just on the first point, so I mean, the way you seek clarity from a court is you make a request of the court. And so we've made a request of the court with respect to the specific language in Callahan, and that's laid out. 
So that's what that's what we mean by clarity, um, and that clarity would be designed to provide us with flexibility. Um, in terms of guardrails, again, I, I, we, we, we don't want to get into speculation here about where this where the judge may go, where this court case may go. Um, and so that would be part of um, part of the further proceedings in the court to work out amongst the parties and, and with the court to determine, okay, how can we go forward here again, given this, given these crisis conditions that were not, that were not in existence at the time of Callahan. Yes, uh, maybe the question of information can uh, uh, ask the answer this question. It's like uh, we heard the governor and the mayor uh, saying that they can, what can they do to really help these asylum seekers to get their work authorization. Mm -hmm. And uh, Commissioner just said uh, early on, uh, there's a long time you can start waiting. Uh, would it not just be easier to just get all the immigrants to get their work authorization to, to help out? So they all go into trouble right now. Over the last several months, I've heard loud and clear from all the different immigrant communities that they too want forms of relief. Uh, so not just asylum seekers, which is why we have been calling for comprehensive immigration reform, which would allow everyone that needs work authorization to access work authorization. One thing we've requested the federal government to do is use their powers to redesignate TPS from any other community of the people who arrived in the last year. Uh, by redesignating TPS to a more recent date, for instance, for Venezuelans, that would allow all of these uh, individuals to access work permits uh, quicker and easier and allow them to get to work faster. Uh, and this applies to many different communities, including West African communities, which we have also been advocating for. So the work of our feder federal legislative team is ongoing. They're in D.C., working really hard, both with our congressional delegation and others in D.C. to try and get something done, because this requires action by the federal government. I've said this over and over. The fate of asylum seekers rests in the hands of the federal government. They're the ones that must act. Thank you. Um, question for Brendan. I, I think it's a reasonable question for New Yorkers to want to know your intentions. And of course, the judge will ask your intentions as well. It's not really a legal strategy. So the question is whether your plan is to shut the door if you get what you want from the court, or is it to perhaps continue to shelter people, but maybe just not get sued over the specific conditions that you might not be able to guarantee anymore? Um, and then um, second, um, have you asked Governor Hochul and the state to join you in this lawsuit and did they decline? So in terms of, I, I, I'm not trying to be cute about, about in my answers, I think the intention here is not to obtain um, again, with you, when you look at the record of the past year of this administration, the intention here is not to get a court order so that we can shut the door and have thousands of people living on the street. That is not the way this administration thinks about this. Um, we have, regardless of our legal requirements, uh, have, done, have gone above and beyond over the last year just from a moral standpoint. And I think the, the, the folks who are involved in this with us um, ad, from the advocate community Again, I think I think there is a, a recognition of the effort that we've put in here. So to, to answer your first question, that this is not the intention. Again, back to the point, which is you want to shelter people to the best of your ability, and you wouldn't stop trying to shelter migrants. It's it's not a question of legal risk. It's a question of the ability that's doing the responsible thing now before the entire system buckles. And it is looking for areas of flexibility where the mayor, as the executive branch, is not hamstrung unnecessarily by a 40-plus-year-old judicial order. To the extent that we can have um, a, an action with a court um, agrees and there can be some flexibility secured, it's to have that flexibility. Do we, do we want to necessarily exercise that in every case, in every way, whatever it may be? Not necessarily. So it's, it's, it's an effort to be responsible here to secure some flexibility now. And about the state joining the uh, litigation, considering that they always were a party in the past. Right. I'm not going to get into specific converse, conversations we've had with them about legal strategy, but I will say that we have been coordinating closely with them um, on, as, at, on a full range of matters, as, as we've said before, um, and continue to do so. Follow up on that, you know, legal aid actually hasn't sued you so far, right? And they've been, I think, sort of in close communication, and there's things that haven't been aligned with the right to shelter all along, right? There's, 
you know, there's not social services on site. The facilities like Randall's Island were way too big, like what the law was already, more than 200 beds. So I guess my question is, what is different now? They've already said, we understand you have a crisis, you're doing what you can. Like, this seems like another step to waive it all together and to ask for the permission if you don't have the resources or capacity to do this. It seems like sort of you, you want to close that door. Right. So I think this is part of the incremental but responsible approach that we've been taking for a year. And the idea here is let's see what is going to happen. I mean, this is, this is now coming sometime after May 11th. We did not know what the federal government was going to do uh, up to that point. We have waited to see what was coming after that. Um, there is no real change that we're seeing from there. So now the question is, what is the next phase of this strategy? Uh, and again, you're, you're right. I think that conversations led by the deputy mayor with legal aid, um, along with the corporation council, um, have been very productive. Um, and um, they will decide to do what, what they decide to do. We recognize and appreciate the role that they have to play and have played here. And I think that's actually gone a long way in making this effort over the last year um, as effective as it has been. So. Yep. Just a quick follow up on that. So um, I think it was Controller Brad Lander said the city could have actually gone to the judge and say this right to shelter requirement could apply to the whole state. Right. Why not take that sort of opposite legal tactic? Well, as a legal matter, he's wrong. There is no constitutional right to shelter. So that's the first issue. There's a constitutional provision that allows one that that mandates the state and its subdivisions to provide care to the poor it does not specify a right to shelter. So as a legal matter, you can't do what he's proposing. Um, but secondly, the issue here is what distinguishes the city from the rest of the state. And one of those things, historically, as you all know, has been Callahan. And so we are, we are addressing that now. And again, the idea here is this isn't an effort here to turn our backs on anyone. The, the past year demonstrates that we're not going to do that. We will not do that. The issue here is flexibility in a crisis. Time for two more and then Mr. McGuire, assuming a favorable disposition <clears throat> and the court adopts the language that you have in your letter, and there's a situation where DHS finds that the city lacks resources and capacity, what happens if an adult male or an adult family shows up and seeks shelter? Specifically, what happens in that case? I understand the question, and I'm not going to answer it because it's a hypothetical that's based on how the court case plays out. We have not put in filings yet. All we have done is the filing yesterday, which is a request for, as you saw, for a judge to be assigned, and it is the first chapter in this. You're asking what is a fair question, but one that we're not in a position right now to answer. Are you prepared to answer it, are you prepared to, answer it to a judge who asks you that very question? When, 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 the, when, the, when the time comes, the, there's no question that, that the law department will be prepared to answer whatever questions the court has. Just to take a slightly different tactic off on Melissa's question, obviously you, the, the city had something in mind when they sought the order, and you did actually give some clarity that you don't want this order to uh, give you the right to just shut people out altogether. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more, because I think some of the concern about this is the uncertainty here. No one really knows what you're trying to do. So thinking about the flexibility, the clarity, before you file the case, not sort of separating that from the, the, the legal machinations that will happen. What do you want? To, what is the clarity uh, and the flexibility that you want specifically? Right. So, I mean, the, the idea here, Joe, is that we have a, there, there are a set of laws and regulations that govern the way that um, the homelessness population has to be, has to be treated here in the city. And so the idea here is to think responsibly and holistically about what what currently governs this crisis and what can we do to ensure that to the extent there are restrictions that we can have some that that that, that can be revisited that may make it uh, more feasible for us to avoid the system in its entirety from buckling under its own weight. And so when 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 we talk about this. As you see in the, in the filing, it, it focuses on adults and adult families, and it focuses on the requirements with respect to them under Callahan, okay? And so the idea here is we, we, we want to understand through go, going, through the, th going through the court system what can be done in light of 
this, this current predicament that we find ourselves in. I understand there's a desire for specific answers here, but part of being in a crisis is that what you have to do is look ahead and try to understand without potentially knowing exactly how everything is going to play out because you never can. What tools, though, can you try to secure today that are going to provide you with the ability to handle the crisis tomorrow? And that's what this is about, more so than any kind of deep, detailed plan that, 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 is, that is sketched out. Because as you know, in a crisis, you're not going to be able to predict with certainty where, where it's headed. Here's what you want, though. Flexibility, flexibility and clarity <laughs> on, on that issue. Is it also a warning shot saying, listen, nobody come here anymore because you won't be able to